out on the machine, a timestamp of it, uh, of the machine, a CPU serial number, version of the OS, et cetera. And so here's actually a graph showing all of that behavior. This is out of one malware. This is a really great fingerprint. Um, first, it queries the uptime of the machine, and then it checks the power settings to determine whether or not the machine in question is a desktop or a laptop. Then it enumerates all the drives, and that would include anything that's external storage as well, like a USB stick, gets the Windows username and computer name, CPU information, and then the version and build number of Windows. All that's packaged up into one packet and sent up to the C2 server. There's a lot of different variations in command and control. A lot of it's done over the web, HTTP, HTTP or HTTPS. Uh, but Aurora was a little bit different. It actually didn't use standard HTTP. It just looked like it. But once you opened it up, it was a custom implementation. Those are things you can use to fingerprint those attackers as well. And those are things that you can look for at the perimeter of the network. IRC is not so common anymore. It used to be used with botnets quite a bit. But now it's mostly web-based stuff. Um, the reason why they sent all this information back up to the servers because they have a big SQL database on the back end that's managing all their infections. Here's the Aurora command and control parser. At point A, the command comes in as a numeric command. It's not written out as text. And then at each location marked in B are all the different code, all the different uh, subroutines essentially that will run based upon the number that's at A. So essentially you have right here all the capabilities of the remote access tool essentially defined for you. Once those things have executed, they regroup at C and send the result back up to the server. This is a great fingerprint. And then finally, let's talk a little bit about stealth and anti-forensics. I'm going to zoom through this a little bit fast. But anti-debugging tricks, a lot of them are placed by packers, so they don't make that good of fingerprints because the same packer will be used by a lot of different people. But if you get anything that looks like it was hand-coded in there, you're in a great spot because it can be very unique. So in this case, in, this is a divide by zero error being caused, and then the structured exception handler will catch. This would detect whether or not a debugger was attached. Um, so I'm just going to go through some slides showing some different stuff that an anti-debugging uh, capability might have in it. So is debugger present? That's just a flag stored off the FS register, but people will actually make the API call, which then just reads the flag. So at the bottom, you can see, well, actually, you can just read the flag directly, too. I've seen code where it just pulls the FS register directly. It doesn't actually use the API call. Heap, manip heap manipulation flags will be different if there's debugging present. And that's another technique that's used. And you can see the uh, assembly language that would be used down there to make that test. Again, more on heap flags. Things that are not obvious, you wouldn't think would be changed. The de debugging environment significantly changes when you're debugging. Um, so we can also check for the debug port. And we can get this response back, letting us know whether or not there's a debugger. Uh, this is another function call that will do something similar. Check to see if a debugger is present, except it's check remote debugger present. But it just wraps the same query that we just saw, anti-query information process, and it sets a flag to true. OK, so here's something that's done at runtime. If you're single stepping, uh, malware may detect whether or not the trap flag is set. There's various mechanisms to do that. Now, you can defeat that if you're in the kernel and you're managing it. But this is another trick that a lot of debugger detection code will have in it. And then um, ZW close with an invalid handle will result in a, an exception if the program is being debugged. It's kind of a non-obvious one. Um, you can set, OK, well, I'm just going to pass through the rest of these. I guess it's worth mentioning read timestamp counter. Uh, you can tell if you're being debugged if you halt, you know, you're single stepping and the timestamp counter is not being maintained, so too much time passes. Now, if you do a search on the net, you'll find a lot of code in the open source that does a lot of this. OK. This is where we're going to get a lot more interesting. All right, so this is GhostNet again. This is going to the algorithm level I was talking about, where the algorithms hardly ever change because it's so hard to get software to work right. This is the algorithm that does the screen scraping, remote screen scraping of your box uh, with the ghost wrap. Every 50th line on the display, it counts by 50. Then it takes a diff against the previous snapshot, so it's not going to send all the raw data again. So it compares those to the previous one four bytes at a time. And if they differ, it goes into a secondary loop where it makes a sort of a data run until the, until the difference has been um, resolved. And that puts it into a, a data structure, offset in the screenshot where the data run begins, the length, and then the actual pixel data. And it's actually then downsampled into black and white, or grayscale. All of that is so specific that if you were to search your enterprise for that, you're going to find GhostNet. That's where, where you'll find that. They're not going to rewrite that every single morning. Um, I actually went into the source code for GhostNet, and this is a really good trick for advanced fingerprinting. If you see large groupings of constants, constants used together, those are great to go on Google code search and look for, see if you can find those constants used in any algorithms, especially things like this where they're so unique. 
So let's go ahead and you can see on the bottom, 8,000, 1625, 652, and 320 were all in this particular function. I just put those in Google Code Search as numbers. And right off the bat, I find a file that has to do with compressing a wave. And I'm like, okay, this has, a, this has a remote audio sniffing capability. It can convert my laptop into an audio bug. There's no other reason a malware would have this capability in there. So it has something to do with audio. I further refine the search, and I actually find the exact source code that I was just using the disassembly for. And I know that because I looked at this, and I went back, and I compared it, and the order everything appeared, and this is it. The guy that wrote the, the uh, Ghost Rat copied and pasted this C audio class into the other system. And this C audio class is just in some totally unrelated, has nothing to do with malware. It's just floating out on the net. OK. Um, we use Palantir uh, at HP Gary for some of our link analysis. At the bottom, at number one, is a source code artifact, or actually an artifact in the binary that we found in the Aurora dropper. And we followed that to number two, where we found a forensic tool mark. And then that, on a, did a search on the net, led us to number three. And so we have a person at number three who posted source code in incomplete form that contained that tool mark. That means you couldn't have cut and pasted this and made that dropper. This guy only put a portion of it on there. Now, maybe behind, in a closed platform, behind closed doors, he may have shared it with other people. I can't know that here. However, I did a search on that information, found his CSDN page, his Baidu page, his QQ numbers, and then found that he had another forum elsewhere where he was selling something called NetBot Attacker. And in that forum were people asking for technical support on their copies of that remote access tool. So you can't get better than this, where you go from a forensic tool mark to the developer to the users of the malware itself. So this is the ideal. So let's talk a little bit more about what we can do with open source research. Um, this guy here, uh, the auto security.net, he makes a key logger. Uh, we did an analysis with Multigo. We found another site just using Multigo alone, where it was actually just a, a file, file AVE. It's just sh sharing files. Inside of there, unprotected, is a file that contains all of the license keys to all of his registered users. I just brought it up. There it is. Those are all the people that currently operate. So it's yet another example of using open source intelligence that connects a malware developer to the actual users of the malware. Now, I have no idea why this was so insecure, but you'll notice if you go through the press that there's a lot of examples of this where C2 servers don't have any authentication, and if you just know how to connect to it, you get all the data that's been stolen. Uh, a lot of security researchers have published blogs where that's been the premise, basically, of getting the data at the C2. Um, now, if you're doing this level of analysis in social spaces, one of the things you can also do is work back the timeline and find out when a particular version was first released and look in your enterprise. If you have that version, you know you were infected after that date. So you can use information like that as well. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on this, but you can penetrate into closed pat platforms, get into IRC channels that you know, are frequented by black hats. Um, you just have to maintain digital cover. There are ways to do that. The black hats themselves have VPN networks that are like anonymizer that you can use to pop out in any country. You can actually buy those. It's a service they give to hackers who are attacking your enterprise. So you could use one of those to go the other direction. If, you, know, you may not want to trust that, but just using it as an example. So you can actually uh, use identities, and you can do contributions to their pages so that you establish your bona fides, and they begin to trust you, or at least enough to start talking with you. And that's something you can do, and it does work. Um, Here's an example. Recently came out, somebody hacked carters.cc. Go up there on, on a P2P sharing network if you can and see if you can get the tar file for this. It's great. Is the identities of every single user on that system. And this thing is a cesspool of crime. Everybody in here is related in some way or another. And all of this data and their email addresses are all now in the open source thanks to whoever hacked them. It was a vigilante hack and it was pretty awesome. Um, so defining threat groups, uh, that's something that's sort of, I'm still working with, but threat groups can't be purely identified from malware alone. You have to look at a lot of factors. So I'm sort of starting at a bigger cloud level and trying to drill down to what does the intent look like for this particular actor? And then from that, looking at their behavior patterns. An example, do they always log in during daylight hours in China? Well, they're probably sitting in a cyber cafe in Shenzhen attacking me. Um, so defining threat groups is something I'm still working with. Fingerprint.exe is the tool. You can go to the, uh, the booth that I have on the vendor floor and get a free copy of this. It's on uh, first hundred only. There's only 100 CDs down there. 
And then at noon today, we're going to put it up on the website as well. But here's an example output. We dropped in an arbitrary binary. Actually, no, it was Ghost in this case. It actually figured out the original project name. It figured out the developer's uh, project directory where they did the actual development from, what compiler, whether or not it has us user interface embedded in it or not. And if so, it'll try to figure out the version number, whether or not there's any compression capabilities, what kind of networking does it use, et cetera. And all that will be dumped out. Now, what's cool about this is when you, you can auto-process in bulk many, many binaries, 10,000 at a time. They're all stored in a database. And then if you go and you run another binary, it'll tell you with percentage of match what it's most similar to in your data set that you already have. So here is every single tool released by Mark Rasanovich, Sys Internals. And you can see they're all closely tied. And then there's a separate group down here. So look, TCP view and TCP, TCP v con are very similar to one another, and they're on island by themselves down on the bottom. So uh, we're going to cluster. This is a great graph. This is a graph of uh, about 3,000 samples of malware, and then the entire contents of a Windows 7 System32 directory. All the System32 directories up there on the top. Over here on the left-hand side are two clusters that formed. We examined those, and those are all the old-school DOS utilities that you can run at the command prompt. And the reason they look different and they clustered separately is because they're significantly different in how they're compiled. And they're also compiled one after the other on Microsoft's build system. So all the timestamps are all in a row. So they clustered up nicely. All the sys internal tools are right there in blue down on the lower left. And what's interesting is I see one malware hanging off there. And I'm wondering what that is. I still haven't looked at it. But I bet you that guy cut and paste some source code from Mark's... Uh, projects, because Mark used to put a lot of his source code up on the net, and um, I'll bet somebody cut, cut and paste maybe control to cap or something like that as a starter for their rootkit. Um, task kill, task con, log off, change log on, all grouped together as a group. The zero malware has that rather symmetrical pattern. Uh, there's another one called YAH lover. There's another one called Rungu, etc. All the auto run infecting malware didn't really group up really close, but it kind of created a strand, and I thought that was interesting. The NLS binaries for multiple language support clustered up nicely into a single group. The thing that's interesting about this is if these are not based upon source code that's in the open source, then these clusterings relate to individual actors. People, uh, the, development, the, the development environment fingerprints themselves can cause the clustering, and then shared source code can also cause the clustering. So this is the beginning of working out threat groups based upon the archaeology of looking through stored malicious binaries. Um, so I'm hoping to go a lot further with this. I'm going to talk to MITRE about their MIC program. Uh, this, again, is all open source just to get this stuff started. This one's really neat. We dropped uh, 7,800 malware through this. And what's really cool is those two on the top actually um, are two separate developers, but they started to share some source code at some point. You can actually see there's a huge colony forming off the bottom it's sharing something with the bottom colony. And then this one over here in the middle, where that one is kind of pulled off like a piece of taffy, it's part of the upper cluster, but it shares something in common with two malware that you can see are pulled off the middle down there on the bottom. And so again, what we're doing is we're actually essentially codenaming each cluster as a threat group. Here's another screenshot. This was 9,800 binaries. I haven't had a chance to go through this one and figure out what these different clusters are yet, because I just got this before the talk. Um, but I thought it was really pretty, so I thought I would put it in here. This, this is uh, all the APT malware from a single US Army base that we've collected. And you'll notice three distinct groupings formed up. Um, unfortunately, the other stuff is scattered out. So I haven't tuned it enough to figure out if there's any actual patterns there yet. But those three clusters are very interesting. All right, so what are your takeaways? Um, using the idea of attribution or bringing things back to the developer, ultimately, at this point in time, means you can do better intrusion detection. It makes your existing security infrastructure that you've already invested in smarter. If you can take things out of the host and use them at the perimeter, you're winning, especially if they have long-term efficacy. And by that, I mean don't use the DNS name. I mean use the command and control protocol itself. Strip the DNS out. Look for file registry, et cetera. Um, Obviously, the current check the checkbox approach is not sufficient to stop attackers. They have intent, they have funding, they're dangerous, so we need to focus on them. We need to stop focusing so much on the malware itself. Um, we have about 400 gigabytes of malware we have not yet processed. 
um, from the intelligence community. We're going to be processing that. So if you're interested in those results and, you, and you're on that side of the house, feel free to talk to me.